In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Everything you see and everything you don't see was fashioned together by Him. Out of nowhere, from nothing, in the rhythm of six mornings and six evenings, time, space, and all living things spun forth. With the utterance of His voice, creation took form. The crown of God's creation was man and woman who could sound His very heartbeat. They joined the Creator in His ongoing work of creation. Then, at the end of the sixth day, God surveyed everything He had made, savoring its beauty and appreciating its goodness. Then, brokenness entered the story, and sin shattered God's design. And as God grieved for His creation, He began the work of repairing and restoring what had been lost. He called forth a new age, an age in which He would make all things new. In this age, our Creator is working all things for good. He doesn't see us as problems to be solved or broken objects to be repaired, but beauty on its way to being formed. Our imperfections are being molded into something more valuable than we could see or imagine. As He patiently works, His love draws us in, and it calls us out. The beauty of His creation beckons us, it captivates us. We are His masterpiece. How is God inviting you to experience beauty this Easter? Good morning. How is everybody? Good? I have a cold. Welcome. All right. Uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 47. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. Today we're going to talk about brokenness. Talk a little bit about life and the fact that the normal life that we live is broken. And, and some of us might put it in the category of like toys that are broken. I know when my kids were little, they would have toys and Jill would tell the kids, hey, go give that to dad. He'll fix it. Which meant that I was handed some highly electronic piece of toy that I have no clue how to fix. So I said, yeah, put it on my workbench. So I put it on the workbench. And then eventually they forgot about it. And, and sometimes it was a really high-tech piece of electronics that just needed a very small Phillips screwdriver to unscrew the thing and put a new battery in it. But I didn't take the time to figure that out. I just so put it on the workbench. Um, or, you know, sometimes it's the stuffed toy that is so nasty. I mean, it's just nasty. You can't even wash it anymore because it'll just fall apart. And you think, if it disappears and we go buy a new one, they won't know. That kind of brokenness. I think sometimes we think like that about God, don't we? You know, God, I gave you my brokenness and you put it on the freaking workbench. Or I gave you this thing that was broken and now you have decided to give me something different and you didn't give me the old. And I notice. And so today I, I want to ask these questions because I want you to know, answer the question, what brokenness are you bringing into the room today? Because it's part of the Easter process. It's part of the beauty of Easter is to understand goodness from last week that Beth brought us, this wonderful thing that God did, this beautiful relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that's beautiful, it's good, and it speaks our identity to us. But we have to deal with the reality of brokenness. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we say, you are good. We declare it, but this morning we declare it in light of our brokenness. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would cause each one to be gathering the pieces of their brokenness in their heart right now. So as we walk through this message, it's real for them. It's tangible. They, they experience and know what it is. And, and when we come to a space, when we're able to say, Lord, would you take my brokenness? We're really 
We really are going to hand you the brokenness today. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a lady named Catherine Wolf. I'll talk about her in a little bit. Uh, but she has this wonderful quote um, that says, Suffering powerfully informs who I am now. While awful and painful affliction has led to a heartbreaking but beautiful deepening within me. So you've got the woman Jesus speaks about in Luke 7 who says, She who has been forgiven much loves much. And then you've got Catherine who says, suffering is very hard and it's heartbreaking, but it's doing something beautiful deep within me. So loving much and a beautiful deepening within me is, is a way to explain Romans 8. Romans 8 is this wonderful verse that we quote often to one another, but I don't think that often we quite want to touch the brokenness. We just hear about the brokenness and then we read Romans 8 to one another. So we read, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that those who love God all thing, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And so I love, I love that verse. It's fun. It's a good verse. It's fun, especially when you just quote Romans 8, 28, and you just say, hey, that's going to work out for the good. And it's kind of encouraging. Um, and, then, and then you're like kind of just jacked up after people leave because you're like, well, that didn't really help me. Because this is still real. The brokenness is still real. This, this shattered, these pieces that don't hold anything is still real. And so I'm not quite sure I get that. Thanks for the encouragement. And so this, this morning, I want us to understand something about the process uh, of Easter and the, the beauty that when we say, will you find beauty in Easter, it's not finding goodness, it's not finding beauty in last Sunday, the goodness, and then, and then waiting through three, three services here, today and next Sunday and Good Friday, and then, and then Easter morning is the goodness because that's restoration. No, there's beauty in the whole process because God is in the whole process. And so it is goodness, it is the thing that we look at, it's the beauty that speaks identity to us, and we go, that is amazing. And then we step into this new reality of brokenness. It may be sin. It may be sin against you. It may be something that you have done to wreck a relationship. It may be all kinds of things can be broken. It's not just toys that our kids play with. It's our lives. And then we step into another phase of this, which is lamenting. Actually understanding brokenness and then being sad about brokenness. And then we see Good Friday, a repair that happens on the cross that none of us quite comprehend, but we could all benefit from. And then we see Easter morning, restoration, new life. You see, beauty is in the whole process. It's not just in the beginning and the end. And so if you miss that, then you'll miss finding beauty in your life. Because we all have to deal with brokenness. We all have to struggle through something that's not as it should have been. If you remember what Beth said last week about beauty, it's the proper things doing, or proper, everything in its proper place doing its proper thing. How many of you have a space in your life that is not in the proper place and it is not doing the proper thing right now? All right, thank you. All of us have a thing that's not beautiful at the moment and that would be broken. So let me pick up where Beth left off last week with Genesis 1 and 2 and leap to Genesis 3. We know the story. Adam and Eve come to the space. They've been walking with God. Everything is beautiful. The garden is just yielding fruit to them and they are living in divine fellowship with God. Exerting work and sweat from the brow, none of that stuff is there yet. This is just beauty. Everything's doing what it's exactly supposed to do. And they're relating to God. There's no questions. 
And then someone inserts a question. The enemy of our soul, it says, Satan enters a question and says to Eve, hey, I think God's holding out on you. I think, I think God's like not really giving you all his goodness because you're not like him. He's like God and you're not. And so, but if you eat of that tree over there, you'll be like him. And so what happened there? Everything in its proper place, doing its proper thing, and mistrust enters the world. And Eve decides to act on that mistrust, and Adam follows right along, the scriptures say, and they choose to be like God and stop trusting that God has been good to them. And so his beauty gets marred in their eyes. And so sin, capital S, capital I, capital N, enters the world. And brokenness enters the realm of creation. Things stop doing what they're supposed to do. Thorns and thistles. And it takes work and sweat to get the same results. Brokenness can happen in all kinds of ways in our lives. It can happen broken toys. There's nothing worse than a kid whose toy breaks right before bedtime. Oh man, your life is broken, their life is broken, and they're going to let you know. Broken dishes, broken deals at work, broken relationships, broken hearts, broken systems in a broken world. So all this brokenness, but at the very core of it, I think is this. It is the predisposition of our flesh to run and hide and push away God. No trust. So when we talk about brokenness, it can mean a lot of different things. It can mean your sin. It can mean uh, something that's not working right in your life. It can mean a relationship that you uh, aren't getting along in. I mean, brokenness can be all those things. But ultimately, at the very core of everything, brokenness is this predisposition in us to say, I don't really trust you, God. And in fact, in this flesh, I would actually mostly hide from you and run from you because I don't trust you. And then that creates more brokenness in the world, doesn't it? Because when I'm broken and you touch my brokenness with your brokenness, I want to slap you. We just saw that not too long ago, right? And so, yeah, that was funny, wasn't it? <laughs> That's probably my brokenness coming out right there. My brokenness, touching your brokenness, will cause me to sin against you. Your brokenness, touching my brokenness, will cause you to sin against me. And I'll compound brokenness. And many of you, you didn't ask for it. You, you, you were just living life. You were just a kid. You were living life and just being innocently a child and someone decided to let their brokenness spill over on you and you got broke and I'm sorry but that's brokenness is none of us get away with not being broken it's it's this we know we were made for this but this is what we see it's just pieces and every once in a while we'll even pick up one and we'll go look I could hold something but it just can't hold enough. And then when that can't hold enough, then now you're not enough. And your brokenness just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. And so today, what is the brokenness that you've brought in? What brokenness have you brought here with you that in a few moments, we're gonna have an opportunity for you to say, could you venture to trust once again God with your brokenness? But before we do that, I want to look at three ladies in the scriptures. First one is in Luke chapter 7. There's these three ladies, these three scenes in the Bible, and uh, each of them has an anointing of Jesus with some kind of oil or perfume. And the first one is in Luke chapter 7. It's a woman at Simon the Pharisee's house, it says. Um, and and I, did, I did some research because I thought, is this, it's the four Gospels. Maybe they just all told the story a little bit differently. There's actually three different ladies involved. And so in Luke, this is about a year away from Passover, a year out, so we're not close to the death of Jesus yet, or the, or the, the week in Jerusalem, the Passion Week. 
And it says this, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees who have invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering to him says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, well, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay it, he canceled the debt of both Now, which of them love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, whom he had canceled the larger debt. And he said, you've judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she's not ceased kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, I don't think this woman would have come to Jesus in the Pharisee's house unless she had already probably encountered Jesus somewhere. I mean, Jesus has been traveling around, and here's, here's a woman that perhaps has already encountered Jesus. Uh, much, like, much like the woman in, in John 8, who was caught in adultery, encountered Jesus, and her life was changed uh, in a moment. She was going to be stoned to death and shamed in a community, and somehow Jesus does a few finger drawings in the dirt and asks a couple questions, and all of a sudden, he's like, hey, you're really beloved. You go and sin no more. So maybe, maybe it's a woman like that who's had that experience. And so here, here Jesus is at a Pharisee's house, religious person's house. Think that, religious person's house. Someone that you would love to go spend some time with. So this person is now hosting Jesus. This woman who's had maybe an encounter with Jesus uh, decides, hey, I'm going to come and I'm going to hang out with Jesus because I just need to express what's happened in me since I encountered him. And so at that time, the tables would have been low to the ground and Jesus would have been reclining on some pillows and probably leaning on one elbow and eating with one hand and his feet would have been curled up a little bit behind him. And they would have been bare because they were in the house. And so she walks in and she doesn't address anybody in the room. She just knows who Jesus is and she comes up and she comes behind him and just starts weeping on his feet. I mean, Jesus is just eating. And all these people are watching this happen, and he doesn't stop her. That, I mean, if that doesn't amaze us just for a moment, um, you know, I mean, if, somebody, if my bare feet are sticking out behind me, and I start getting like somebody's crying on my feet, and there's tears, and there's oil, and there's, you know, it's a weird moment. I mean, it's going to be a weird moment for everybody. But she does this, and he doesn't say anything and and then Simon's man you know wandering in his head he's like oh if this dude was really a prophet he would get this he would really know who she is so he's already kind of questioning Jesus and Jesus because he does know things goes hey I got something to say to you because you're thinking thoughts and I know what you thought and I'm gonna I'm gonna help you with that thought you're wrong she's doing a, she's doing the right thing She's doing the right thing. So then we move on to John chapter 12, and we see Mary, the sister of Lazarus and the sister of Martha. And it says this, six days before the Passover. So here we are now, a year later, close to the time of the crucifixion, and we are six days out, and Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was. Lazarus is the dude that Jesus raised from the dead just a little while ago, so he was a dead guy, and now he's a live guy, so keep that in mind. 
Mary's experienced Jesus in a pretty profound way. So they gave dinner for him there. Martha served. Martha just never leaves the serving category. She hangs there. It's her, it's her thing. Uh, and then Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who he was, was about to betray him, said, why is this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? So Mary has done this amazing thing, very similar to a year ago when a woman who was a sinful woman uh, anoints Jesus. Now Mary's doing it, and, and Judas is, is, or is one of these guys that just has to you know, open his mouth and probably try to shame her. But then we understand in verse 6, Judas said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So he's going, man, that was 300 denarii, and I could have gotten my hands on a little bit of it. And then Jesus says, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial, or that she has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you'll always have with you, but you don't always have me. Now, can you imagine this house, probably not a huge house, um, but, but a house nonetheless, and all of a sudden you've got this ointment being poured over Jesus, and the fragrance moves throughout the house. I mean, Jill lights candles in our house, and it's always fun when you come home and she's lit like a candle, um, you know, especially if it's like snickerdoodle cookie or vanilla, you know, I mean, those are like my favorite ones, I like those, those are good, um, and then, and then, uh, so if you invite me over to a house, vanilla and snickerdoodle, okay, so that's the one. Just light them up, and I'll be like super at home when I get there. Um, so that's awesome. But can you imagine the smell all through the house? And you're only six days away from, from the crucifixion, and, and perhaps this, this aroma of brokenness that has been poured out, this extravagant worship of Mary, perhaps when, when on the cross... They're piercing his feet. The soldiers get a whiff of this aroma. I'm like, what does that smell? He's been anointed before he was ever buried. And then we move to Matthew chapter 26 and Mark chapter 14. Now, this is the same story told two different times, uh, one by Matthew, one by Mark. And it says now... When Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, so we have another Simon, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? This could have been sold for a large sum given to the poor. I think they were just repeating what Judas said like four days ago, because this is like two days out from the crucifixion and Mary and Martha and Lazarus' story, that one is six days out. <laughs> for this could have been sold for a large sum given to the poor, but Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And then Mark tells a very, very similar, similar story. The word beautiful, when Jesus says this in Mark and in, in Matthew, and he says, what she's done is a beautiful thing. It's the word kylos. And it means a good that inspires others to embrace what is lovely or beautiful. So when, when Mary's pouring oil over the head of Jesus, and the disciples are kind of, Freaking out a little bit, like, man, we could have sold that. Judas just said we could have made 300 denarii. That would have been awesome. Um, we could have helped the poor. Maybe their hearts were right. I don't know. But they still were missing the point that what she was doing was beautiful. And it was supposed to be inspiring them to do something and to embrace something lovely and beautiful. And so these three stories are just, they're, they're, they're amazing to me. And in fact, the ones in, in Matthew and Mark, I, I need a space probably to do this because I like to speculate. 
Uh, I heard somebody say that if you're going to say something that's not quite biblical, but you think it could be, you should not stand there. So, okay, so I'm just not going to stand there while I say this. But I really think that the one in, in, uh, in Matthew and Mark, what, what if that was the woman who was caught in adultery? She's been undone by the grace of God. So she pours out this extravagant worship. And just imagine. So there's some quick observations here. Jesus says all these women, either they did the right thing. So remember, everything in its proper place, doing its proper thing, or right thing. It's beautiful. So in Luke 7, she was doing what was right. In John 12, it is the right time for this. Matthew 26 and Mark, she has done a beautiful thing. You see, these women were fulfilling Old Testament prophecy as well. Because Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Jesus Christ is not a name, it's a title. So Jesus, the Christ or the Messiah, is also, those two words mean the anointed one. And so here, all of Israel's been waiting on the anointed one to come because they've been hearing about it for hundreds of years, telling the stories. There's one coming, a Messiah's gonna come, he's gonna be anointed. And here these women are anointing him. It's prophetic fulfillment, if you catch it. But most people, like the disciples in Judas, or even the Pharisee, they just get indignant because beautiful acts will always cause others to be indignant. The Pharisee sees the waste and he wants to just dismiss her as a sinner and dismiss Jesus as a prophet. Judas was indignant. You know what Judas did just three verses later? He sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. 300 denarii is like 300 days of wages, almost a year's worth of wages wrapped up in a bottle. 30 pieces of silver is like four months of wages. So for a third of the cost, Jesus, uh, Judas sold out Jesus. There's all kinds of points that we can make there, but we won't. Each woman probably had encountered Jesus. Each woman had had some moment at which their brokenness had been in front of Jesus and Jesus did something miraculous. And then this anointing is response. This anointing didn't produce something in the heart of Jesus for them. Something had been produced in their hearts to anoint Jesus. We are always responding to the grace and the mercy of God. Now let's return for a moment to Catherine Wolfe, uh, who I quoted at the very beginning. She, coming right out of college, maybe just a few years, she'd been married for three years, married her college sweetheart. They'd had a baby six months earlier, and she has what they call a hemorrhagic stroke and almost dies. She now goes through, uh, she had to go through a life-threatening surgery that she was going to die without it, but perhaps would die because of it. So she's got a six-month-old, a husband of three years, um, facing major changes. And then a year of rehab and trying to figure things out to see if she could learn to speak and walk and use her limbs again. And at the end of the day, her face, one side of her face is paralyzed, um, and she has very little physical capabilities. But she has all of her mind and her spirit. And so in Just Between Us, a magazine, uh, they asked this question, how has marriage been both a joy and a challenge as you walk these past few years together? And they had a second child three or four years later, and now they have a ministry that they, that they run, uh, Hope Heals. Catherine answers this question this way. She says, my husband Jay puts it very well when he says, if suffering is like going through fire, I want to choose what this inescapable process purifies in me and not what is melted away. I find my faith and my hopes solidifying into something more constant than my emotions or my circumstances, creating an altogether separate organism, and that is so freeing. Sim similarly, the commitment I have made to marriage is growing deeper, more enduring, and less dependent on whether a given day is good or bad. 
The humbling process of, being, of serving and being served has caused our hearts to be softened. We're finding that acting out of love inevitably provokes true feelings of love. In the daily melting away of frustrations and bitterness, we can embrace and celebrate the gift of this new life together. And in the midst of the mundane, we can remember the miracle. You see, Catherine and her husband Jay, they they live in this state that this is what they hoped for. It's just a beautiful bowl. But their life was shattered in pieces at the hand of a stroke. And they couldn't do anything about it. And so here they are now trying to figure out, what do I do with the pieces? And in that brokenness, they leaned into Jesus and they found something deep happen. In fact, when asked about her favorite verse, she says it's Hebrews 6.19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Anchoring in Jesus is the thing that heals our souls, she says, and our souls are where we need the most healing anyway. When all seems lost, there's always hope in the tender arms of Jesus and in his magnificent story of your life. You see, guys, when we, when we come into brokenness, there's this, this, this piece of, I don't, I don't really want this. I don't want this brokenness. I don't want to have my sin. I don't want my sin to mess your life up. I didn't want somebody to sin against me and mess my life up. I didn't want the relationships that I have to be broken. I didn't want all of this. But yet we we stand right here on the edge of the life of today and we go, there are things that aren't the way they're supposed to be in my life. And so we have choices. We get to make a choice here. We get to deny our brokenness. You can come over here and you can look at your life and you go, you know what, this makes me mad. And I'm not going to be broken. There it is. I decided. I'm not broken. I'm not broken and you can't make me be broken and I will be self-sufficient and independent in my life um, and that's what I'll be. You get to choose that. And if you do, you will probably land in a space that says I have no needs and I will remain ultimately alone. Perhaps you'll be mad and angry every time somebody finds hope because you'll be mad because you gave up hope long ago to be independent and unbroken. Judas Iscariot is a thief among the disciples and was indignant because he was not willing to see the beauty of the brokenness in front of him and maybe possibly exchange his own brokenness. But he held on to the space in his own heart that said, I just am greedy and I want. In the story of the younger brother, we have an older brother who kind of is a sideline character. Yet the longer I read that particular story, the more often I find myself being an older brother I always wanted to be just the younger guy without the failing. Is that possible? Yeah, think on that one. It's not possible to be the younger brother without the journey. But the older brother is living in this place of, I don't need the father, I just want what he has, and I don't need anybody else. And so when this younger brother comes back and there's mercy given, all of a sudden he is mad. Does that grab you at all? When you see somebody else receive extreme mercy in their brokenness and you go, ugh. Why? Is it perhaps because you want, you just are denying your own brokenness? Or maybe you go in this way of defining yourself by brokenness. You remain in the identity. You're like, you know what? This is my life. This is it, it's broken, it's worthless, I can't do anything, I'm not enough. And in fact, don't help me, don't help me, don't help me, please. I- I'm doing just fine, I'm broken, and this is, this is me, this is me. You can feel sorry for me, and you can do things for me and help me, but this is what I am, and you don't fix me, and you don't give me any hope. 
because I don't listen. This, this is it right here. This is it. Oh, that piece. I love that piece. That was a nice piece. That was fun. That was fun when it used to be in place. But see, it's broken now. It doesn't work, which is what my life is. It doesn't work. And I'm defined by this. So instead of being independent, you become codependent and you live in emotionally unhealthy communities and you make people live around you on eggshells and your life consumes them because you're always the victim. Or we have an option to declare what is true, just to declare our brokenness. You see these women give us this beautiful, beautiful picture of just going, well, this is my life. I'm not sure what to do with it. It's just broke. So I won't be defined by my brokenness because I'm in the presence of Jesus who is beautiful and he speaks identity to me that says this isn't who I am, but it is who my life is right now. And so then you just go, here, Jesus, I don't know what you do with this. But I'm not going to ignore it. I'm not going to be defined by it. But I will give it to you. This is what we're offered. This is, this is what these women experienced. Is a Jesus who said, you see, you see my crumbled life? It's just crumbled. I can't fix it. And in fact, I'm not sure anybody can fix it. I'm not sure if I want it fixed. Because I'm not sure even that that was the life I was supposed to have. Because I'm in the presence of one who says I'm made for something greater. Ronald Rollheiser says this wonderful little quote about the Paschal mystery, which is about dying so that new life can emerge. He says, the Paschal death is a death that while ending one kind of life, opens the person undergoing it to receive a deeper and richer form of life. You see, when brokenness is declared, it begins new life. And so you don't have to deny your brokenness. You can let healing begin because Jesus is a healer. But the healing is not going to be the healing that maybe you expect. It's going to be one that incorporates your brokenness. And you'll see the marks of your brokenness in his healing in your life. You don't get new, perfect, unbroken. You get redeemed, repaired beauty. Another way to say it is when you declare your brokenness, you're transparent. Or perhaps you could go to the next, and, and when you bring your brokenness next to one who is stronger than you, and you trust, that becomes interdependence. Because the, the beautiful picture of interdependence that you see with Jesus and this woman is that Jesus didn't stop them from anointing him. He just let it happen. Because they did something no one else was going to do for him. They anointed. So in their brokenness, they offered something to Jesus. And in his strength, he received it. He didn't say, no, 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 you're not, you're not fixed yet. I haven't redeemed you fully yet. You're, you're not ready to give me anything. He said, no, exactly where you're at, you can give to me and I'll receive. And then out of that connection, you can find peace with God and yourself and with others. Stephanie Gretzinger is a singer for uh, Bethel, and she speaks this in the, these lyrics out of, in the song Out of Hiding. It says, come out of hiding, you're safe here with me. There's no need to cover what I already see. You've got your reasons, but I hold your peace. You've been on lockdown, and I hold the key. Because I loved you before you knew it was love and I saw it all, still I chose the cross. And you were the one that I was thinking of when I rose from the grave. Now rid the shackles of my, vic my victories yours. I tore the veil for you to come close. There's no reason to stand at a distance anymore. You're not far from home. I'll be your lighthouse when you're lost at sea. And I will illuminate everything. No need to be frightened by intimacy. 
No, just throw off your fear and come running to me. And then she says this piece. So if you can imagine the picture, here you are in your life and your brokenness and you're so far away from Jesus and he's calling out to you and he's saying, well, you could come, you could come. And she says, what's going to happen is the thing that has hindered love in your life will become part of your story if you just come. You're so close to home. That's what, that's what, that's what Jesus is saying. That's what the cross does for us. Is it creates a way for us to come with all this brokenness and just go, hmm, I wonder, wonder if what you could do without Jesus. And you see the, the Kitsungi masters in Japan, these artists that do this, this thing. I can't remember if I'm told not to touch this. Um, but anyway, this is repaired. And there's, there's this gold on the inside that's so beautiful. But it doesn't hide the brokenness. And you see, the, the masters, actually, they, they come, and, they, and these families in Japan would actually break a dish that was like a family dish, and it needed to go from generation to generation, and then all of a sudden, they would have all of these pieces, and, and they would bring them to a master. They may wait may years. They would wait until they found a master who could actually put it back together with this art form. And so when the master got it, his first weeks and months possibly were simply to examine the brokenness and to become intimately aware of every fracture, every space that needed to be repaired, every bit of dust that had been broken off of the dish and, and perhaps even grabbing a hold of a space where it's like, oh, I, I, I see I see how that broke in your life. That had to hurt. That was so painful. And so he, know, he knows that one. And then, and then that other thing that happened in your life, he's like, oh, oh, I see that too. I understand every fracture. There's not one fracture in your life that I don't know. And so we have this masterful work where actually it requires the brokenness to get the art. Your life isn't beautiful tomorrow without today's brokenness. Because this is how God designed it. Because God had goodness, and then there's this brokenness, and lament, and repair, and restoration, and the restoration bears the marks of all the past process. So, Psalm 34.8 says this, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. Psalm 51, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise a contrite heart. Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. It is good for us to be near to God, says Psalm 73. When you are ready to bring your brokenness to Jesus, he is ready to begin new life in you. The script to our video reads this. Our creator is working all things for good. He doesn't see us as problems to be solved or broken objects to be repaired, but beauty on its way to being formed. Our imperfections are being molded into something more valuable than we can see or imagine. You see, the, the artists in Japan, they actually see the brokenness as, as part of the beauty. Because if you didn't have those fractures, you wouldn't have this lacing of gold and beauty that happens. And so in your life, it's, it's okay that there's brokenness. It's not okay to define yourself by it. It's not okay to de deny it. It is okay to declare what is true. 